The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. Um, welcome everybody to uh, current topics in media computing and HCI. Uh, I'm Jan Borges, but you probably know me from, from other classes already. Uh, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to go over how this class works, what, you know, what it is about, administrative details, and stuff like this. Um, and then we'll jump right into the first topic, so you'll uh, get a head start on how research in HCI is actually conducted and how uh, we do our job. Um, as usual, you also know this already if you've taken any of our classes, uh, this is the most important part of today. Right? Remember this jump page, right? You will need it later uh, because we'll have to do a couple things to sign up for the class, to get a seat, and all those kinds of um, issues. So make a note of this. As usual, it's our homepage slash CTHCI for current topics in HCI. All right, um, let me quickly introduce you to everybody who's going to be doing this. It's a lot of people actually this time. Um, I'm going to be teaching uh, the individual, uh, sort of the, the initial classes of this uh, lecture. Um, and um, Marcel and uh, Zara, who are both here uh, this morning, um, will be your teaching assistants throughout the class, throughout the semester. Um, so they are going to be uh, accompanying this class all the way. Um, but then when we get to the um, individual topics lectures of this class, which is sort of the second half of this class, uh, you will also get to know a couple of our other PhD students who are currently doing their research at our lab because they will be taking over introducing you to specific hot topics that are currently you know, being uh, looked at in HCI. Not just our lab, of course. We're not just going to be talking about our own stuff, um, but we're going to take a look at how HCI research, you know, what, what's currently going on in HCI research in general through our lens, so to say, through our lens of what interests us and what we find particularly uh, relevant. Um, so, uh, one of the things that uh, we always want to uh, get clear is if you have a question, then there's a couple options, right? Um, if it's something uh, that isn't, you know, super private and you, you know, not, not something where you're super nervous about sharing with others, then please do use the Moodle forum, right? That would be your default place to ask because obviously other people are probably going to have the same question and so then we don't need to answer the same question 15 times and we can spend more time helping you guys in other more productive ways. Um, if it is something personal, then of course, you know, you're free to send an email. Um, the recommendation is to send it to Zara and Marcel, um, not to me. I get a lot of email and I don't get around to answering it all. So you have better chances of actually getting a prompt reply uh, from these two wonderful folks. Um, and if you want to increase your chances even further, then you put CTHCI in the subject prefix and then they can quickly see, oh, this is about the class, and then they can get right to it. All right. Um, the alternative, if you like, you know, the good old wet and squishy way of personal interaction, um, then you can also just, you know, stick around after the class um, and uh, talk to us um, for a quick chat. That's also fine. Usually, any questions about, like, you know, what do I need to do for this assignment? How do I need to submit this? And how, how do I need to do that? Uh, again, these two folks are usually the best person to ask. So, um, what is this class about? This class is actually our most advanced and, and research-oriented class of all the ones that we are teaching. Um, and it has a pretty clear focus about what, it is, what it's trying to do and who it is for. Um, the idea of this class is to make you understand, to help you understand how scientific research in HCI is actually conducted. So, um, and not just understand it, but also actually get to practice it. Um, we have um, a little project as part of this class, I'll get to that later, uh, where you will be doing HCI research. At small scale, of course, we, we don't have that much time, but you will go through all the actual steps of how you know, researchers around the world find out new things about human-computer interaction. Now, there's tons of research going on at this department, right, in computer science. So why is this relevant and why is this special? Because um, 
in HCI, we actually do research, well, not entirely different from, from others in the computer science department, but we tend to use other methods that you may not have been exposed to before and that you may not ever get exposed to in computer science. Um, and that is what's called empirical research. When I think of empirical research, like I always imagine sort of like the white lab code researcher, you know, like at her workbench doing stuff. And that's actually not the worst picture to have in mind for this. The point is, we're not all wearing white lab coats, we don't have any, but uh, we do conduct research in an empirical way, meaning that we run experiments, usually involving users, because we're looking at you know, user, uh, human computer interaction, uh, and we analyze these with statistical methods, so all the wonderful knowledge of statistics that you have all deeply ingrained in your soul from your statistics classes earlier on uh, will become useful. Um, and, and that is actually a little different from many other areas of computer science that often build systems and, and run technical evaluations and say like, okay, our, I don't know, voice recognition system is 0.3% better than you know, this other system on this data set, uh, which is also perfectly valid research, but it's a different approach. It's more this approach of engineering research, building stuff, making sure that it's better than what's out there. And we do these things a little different. So um, you get to practice that um, in our research projects. You also get to practice how to retrieve and evaluate information from the literature. Because guess what? You know, a lot of research is about reading stuff. We're, whatever, I don't know, what, 8 billion people on the planet right now? You know, they're not all doing HCI research, but there are a lot of people out there doing HCI research, having done HCI research, and the way that a research community works, you know, a global research community works and communicates is not on Facebook, it's by writing papers and others reading those papers. And there's a very well-established and quite well-functioning system of getting validated trustful results out there that other people then can pick up with confidence. And this is how we communicate, right? This is how we talk. We don't just go and say, oh, I think this is true, or I think this is true. Uh, you can do that, but that's not research, right? That's, that's opinions. Um, and so we will try to teach you how to draw information out of the research that's already out there so that you can build on it, right? Because we don't want to repeat things that have already been done before. Uh, usually that's not you know, very interesting. Uh, sometimes you need to do that, but usually you want to find out something new. So you first need to understand what's out there. And if that sounds sort of, you know, vaguely relevant to what you're going to be doing soon, which is like maybe writing a thesis, then yes, it is, right? So this is ideal for you as a student if you're considering doing your thesis at our lab, right, at our chair. Um, but also if you're doing it at other labs, of course. Um, it's just that we will be looking a lot at this empirical approach to research, um, which you know, you're very likely to be using when you um, do your thesis here at our lab. But also if you're considering maybe you know, a career in research, if you've been you know, vaguely imagining maybe doing a PhD after your master's, uh, then this will also be a great way to understand what you know, the daily bread and butter work looks like um, in research um, as a PhD student, at least in HCI. And, so, and then the second part of the class, as I said, is about these current topics that are you know, going on in HCI research. So we will be taking the latest conference papers and journal articles, uh, and we will be discussing them with you um, sharing their contents with you and discussing what, how, why they're relevant, how, you know, how the research, um, how the paper manages to convince us that the research is, is true and valid and what its, what its impact is for the HCI community. And these will be focusing on different topical areas. I'll get to these in just a second. Um, this second part of the class also has another kind of hidden bonus feature, which is Again, if you are considering doing your thesis with our lab, then that second part is almost like, you know, uh, Germany's next top model for HCI researchers at I-10. So all our PhD students will be up here um, and will be sharing with you uh, what 
they currently you know, have found as an interesting area of HCI research that they've deeply you know, gotten involved in, read all the papers, uh, written some themselves. Um, and so since they are also often looking for master's students, bachelor's students uh, to do work with them, then that's also usually a wonderful way to find out, oh, I like this person, I like the stuff they're working on, I like the way that they presented, you know, the chemistry is right, so maybe you find your favorite, uh, you know, PhD student to talk to about a potential thesis topic. All right, so um, that's a few things about how the class works. Next thing I want to understand is who you guys are. So uh, let's do a quick uh, live poll here. These are lots of areas in which people could be, you know, that people could be studying in. I want to understand who's actually in the room today. So uh, let's begin. Master of Science, Computer Science. Who's in that program? That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I think ten people. Okay, good. Uh, so that I, I expect that to be the majority. Um, Master of Science in Media Informatics. Anybody from there? Yeah, one, okay. Um, Master of Science in Software Systems Engineering, SSE. Okay, another one, wonderful. Uh, then next up, we have Bachelor of Science in Technical Communication or Master of Science in Technical Communication. Yay, awesome one, thank you. Um, great. Um, usually, I'm, I'm guessing with a, you know, technical communication with computer science as a as combination, yeah. Um, Okay, so then we have sometimes people from uh, electrical engineering, information technology, or computer engineering also end up here. Anybody from that area? No? Nope. Okay. Um, well, they might still show up. Um, I think we saw a registration or two, right, from that? Yeah, okay. <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, data science. Computer, uh, sorry, computational social systems. Uh huh. Okay. Um, and uh, simulation science. All right. And, and then finally, bachelor's in computer science. Also. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so this is a master's class, but you can kind of like. You, okay. You take it and you. Okay. Yeah. You're doing it in, in ahead of time, so to say. All right. Good. Um, the the other thing I wanted. Did anybody that I didn't didn't uh, bring up as a an area? No? All right, okay. Then the next thing is, uh, who in here has attended DIS-1? Show of hands. All right, that's not everybody. Um, we don't make it a technical prerequisite, like a formal prerequisite, but it is really highly recommended that you have taken DIS-1 for a couple of reasons. First of all, DIS-1 is Designing Interactive Systems 1 is um, our class that sort of breaks the fundamentals of what usability and user experience and user-centered design and all these things are about. And those are kind of the, I wanna say, you know, way of thinking underpinnings of doing HCI research. Um, if you haven't taken that class, well, I should say the other reason why, why it's, it's important to have taken that class or really helpful is that there are a couple techniques uh, that we will be building on in, in this class that, that you learn in DIS-1. Um, for example, uh, you know, in DIS-1 already we've started doing things like user studies with people. And um, if you've taken DIS-1, you've had a little bit of experience with that, and we're gonna build on that experience uh, in this class. So, but like I said, I don't wanna exclude anybody if you are really eager to take this class and really committed to doing it and you're ready to put in a, maybe a little extra work catching up on a few things in DIS-1, uh, because all the videos are out on YouTube, so you can watch them you know, at your leisure uh, and catch up on the topics, um, then uh, by all means, be our guest. If you feel unsure about this, you know, do send an email to these two folks or ask on the forum. Um, you know, share what you know about these things and, and why you're here, uh, and then we'll figure out whether it's, you know, it's a good fit for you or not. Um, Okay, so um, a couple more administrative details. Uh, this class is uh, taken for six credits. Usually, I gotta say, because every now and then there is some program that adds our class to its 
syllabus and doesn't quite tell us about it and ad ends up you know, ass assigning different credits to it. So uh, check your you know, Prüfungsordnung, your exam regulations uh, to find out whether it's six credits, but it usually uh, should be. Um, and as you know, one credit is 30 hours of work for an average student to get an average grade, right? That's the ballpark number. So um, you will be spending you know, a fair amount of work in this class. Uh, lectures and labs are on these uh, times and dates that we've posted here, and uh, the course language is English, so uh, we won't be uh, allowing any dictionaries in the exam. Um, beyond the pure times that you're going to be here in class, hopefully uh, joining me and, and joining Marcel and Zara in the in the labs, uh, you'll be spending uh, a fair amount of additional time on reading assignments, on uh, writing assignments, exercises that we uh, propose you do to practice the skills of, of reading and writing research, uh, and then also on the project. Um, the, so that's why I think it's, it's a good idea to expect to spend around nine hours a week during class times, you know, during, during those weeks that we have classes um, in this class. So don't overcommit, you know, with uh, five other big six credit classes at the same time. I don't think that's going to work out. Um, seating is limited uh, to the strange number of 39 seats because we do groups of three for the research project. Um, and uh, if you want to get into this class, there's a couple things uh, you need to do. First thing is you need to register an RWH online. You need to do that by the end of today if you haven't already. Um, anybody not registered yet, just out of curiosity? doesn't change your chances of getting accepted. So, all right, everybody's in there, all right, good. Um, end of today, uh, we will be assigning seats uh, before tomorrow's lab. So we're trying to, we're making this deadline so tight because we want to give you guys very quick feedback about who's in the class and who isn't, so you can, you know, pick another class if this doesn't work out. Um, next up is signing the declaration of compliance document. Uh, and uploading it to the SIBO folder. This is the information about this is on the class website. Um, uh, and we ask you to follow a naming scheme. You don't need to do that upload right now. It doesn't change anything whether you do it now or after the class. In fact, I'd rather you do it after the class than getting distracted now. Uh, but do when you do f this stuff, please follow our naming scheme here. So for example, you know, CTHI 23 DOC for declaration of compliance. And then we have your matriculation number and then your last name, right, dot PDF. The reason why this is a good idea to follow a naming scheme is because we're going to have a script parse all these files, pull out the information, and if we have 39 people who managed to do that right, then, you know, and you didn't, then you're probably not going to be on the list. Okay. For all of this, the deadline is um, tonight. All right. Uh, now I'm going to talk about uh, how the course is structured. I already mentioned that we're going to start with HCI research methods, right? So we're going to start diving into basic concepts of how research is conducted, what kind of HCI research is out there, how people do uh, research in human-computer interaction. Um, and that will be going on for the first um, roughly two, two months here. Um, and then the, uh, this is being accompanied by a lab, uh, which, start, which gives you a chance to practice these concepts. Um, maybe as a change from the classes you've taken with us um, last semester, uh, we're not going to be requiring you to do these assignments on, on the first part of the lab. They are our offer for you to practice the things that we, uh, we are trying to teach you. Um, and we will be discussing the solutions to these things. In fact, we'll be asking some of you to present your solutions to these things each week. Um, and give everybody a chance to ask about, you know, things that they uh, were wondering about with their solution compared to what we uh, are discussing. But we won't be grading or um, uh, reviewing your submissions on a basis that adds to your final score. You know, in the past, we usually had a couple of points um, that you could, you know, a certain percentage of points you could add to your final grade by doing these assignments. We're not doing that this semester. Uh, so what that means, it's I'm kind of asking you guys to be, to be grown up about this, right? So you're at a university, it's academia, it's a lot of freedom. With that comes great responsibility, right? So please do take this opportunity, don't take this lightly, and don't 
say, oh, I don't need to do these assignments, so I'm not going to do them, because that's going to uh, not lead to a satisfying result, right? You might make it through the final. Your grade's not going to be that awesome if you, you know, just uh, learn in the 20, you know, 72 hours before the exam and cram it all in your head and write it down. You're going to forget about it soon after, and that's kind of a waste of everybody's time, really. So do please take these uh, assignments seriously, do them, use the forums to get back to us, ask us, you know, pelt these folks with questions in the, in the labs, um, and that's what we're trying to do here. Then somewhere around this, uh, this first part, as you can see here, we've got, you know, three of these uh, uh, assignments that are, uh, that are completely, um, you know, optional for you to do in terms of we're not going to be adding them to your final grade. Then starts the uh, mini HCI research project, which gives you a chance to actually practice conducting HCI research. Um, and this is going to be then done in groups of three, whereas the first assignments uh, are individual ones. Right? And this starts with uh, a couple of milestones that we've uh, dropped in here every couple of weeks uh, that will also be being discussed in the, in the lab. And we will guide you along so that you, you know, get feedback on each step of that project. Now, this project in the end will be part of your final grade. So we're not going to let you completely off the hook here. It's not just the final exam. We can, we've thought that this research project is really a bit too important um, to not have it being a graded and um, relevant part of your final result. Now, while this is going on, then at some point we will be switching to that part two of the current topics lectures where our research assistants, our PhD students will uh, take you through, you know, we've, we've selected a bunch of topics that I'll talk to you about in a minute, um, and they will share these things with you. There was a misunderstanding in the past that this is not relevant for like the exam or anything. That's not true, right? The stuff that we discuss with you in current topics in the second part is going to be just as relevant in the exam as the first part of the research methods, right? So don't, don't skip those classes. Don't skip learning about these topics. We want you to become versed in, you know, a, an area of current HCI research so you can go out there and pick, you know, a topic for your thesis, for example, with confidence and knowing where you want to go. All right, so then at the, towards the end of the semester, we've got project presentations, which are actually, um, you know, around July 11th and 12th, so it's a little bit um, ahead. You need to be there for these dates. So if you want to take this class, mark your calendar today um, and put these you know, two dates in there because you need to be in the class for these two, um, two dates. And then we've got the final exam, first, um, the first one on July 21st, and the second one is currently scheduled for August 25th. So again, those dates are probably also uh, a good idea to keep open and not uh, book a trip to the Bahamas. All right, um, what are these current topics that we are doing? Or are there any questions about this part? Feel free to, to ask us back. We're a small enough group that we can have a discussion about this. Everything crystal clear? Yes, okay, good. All right, then let's take a look at the topics we're gonna be discussing about, just to give you a taste of what, what's coming up, right? Um, let's just start on the left. Um, one of the things that we've been doing quite a lot is actually looking at physical interfaces and looking at user interfaces, not just as pixels on a screen, but as things that are embedded in real life objects. The reason for that is that, you know, when I started doing HCI research myself in the 90s, if anybody said user interface, you knew it was basically going to be pixels on a screen, right? Probably on a desktop monitor, like, you know, CRT or maybe then later on a laptop, or maybe on a tablet, ooh. But it was always pixel on the screen. And uh, that's completely changed, of course, right? Nowadays, you can go out and you know, get jackets with smart buttons stitched on them, or uh, you can, you know, you've got your watch, and you've got you know, tactile feedback and whatnot. You've got voice interface. So user interfaces have become much more diverse and have really permeated every aspect of our lives. Um, some of that we've discussed in DIS1, right? And because of that, we figured we want to really take a more holistic look at what HCI is about. So we want to look at user interfaces uh, that have a software part to it, but they also have some kind of physical 
you know, material form. They have some substance to them. And uh, that's an exciting new space where prototyping gets a little harder because we can't just fire up Emacs and, you know, and write some code or Xcode or whatever. Uh, we actually need to go and, you know, stitch fabric or, or do these kinds of things or 3D print something, but it's, it's very exciting. A lot of new unexplored territory opens up that way. So as part of that, um, um, Oli and uh, others at our lab, we've been looking at textile interfaces. You know, the very simple idea is you're in your smart home of the future and you're like, you know, sitting in your lounge chair and you're watching TV and, and now Paul gets nervous because he needs to adjust the camera. Um, and, and as you're doing this, you're like, you know, I want to change the program. Right? So, okay, the remote is then obviously not in reach, right? Because it never is where you expect it to be, right? So you could start talking to, you know, your favorite home assistant, but that's kind of embarrassing when you're watching a movie, especially maybe you've got some guests there. So couldn't I just maybe reach over to my, you know, around the armchair and touch the armchairs, you know, uh, touch the, uh, the armrest and, and have some controls there, right? Right in, in the fabric, that would be nice. Question is though, when you do this, how should they look? What, what should they look like? Um, what kind of objects, for example, what kind of shapes can you distinguish really well without looking? And, you know, little uh, sneak peek, it's not the shapes that you can distinguish well by looking at them. You know, shapes that look visually very distinct, we often have a lot of trouble figuring out that they are distinct when we just touch them. So there's lots of interesting findings there in this, in this work uh, that Oli will be talking about. This is some stuff that we've done ourselves, but of course it's not just gonna be about our work in this, but the general space of what's happening around interfaces in the smart home that are embedded into things like fabrics and, and, and furniture and stuff like this. Second up, um, Marcel here is gonna be talking about collaborative knowledge sharing. Um, he's taken a very intense look at how people document, for example, uh, maker projects, DIY projects, and how once they've done this, how they write down what they learned and how then others can use that, you know, those tutorials that you find on like Thingiverse and those kinds of platforms. And if you then you know, need to change that tutorial because you happen don't, to not have the same materials, how does that process work? There's a lot of interesting stuff going on there. Um, very few people, who's ever been in a fab lab, can I ask, just real quick? Okay, few people, you know, 3D printed something, laser cut something. Very few people that go there actually are excited about writing down what they did. Right? And docu ah, documenting your project kind of sucks, you wanna make something, right? And so that's kind of what, what you know, started Marcel on this journey on, of, of exploring how to improve that situation. Why, not, why can't we have a system that will actually automatically track our tool use when we're building you know, something uh, like a birdhouse and as we're building it, it actually already figures out what tools we've used and it writes the documentation for our project automatically. That'd be cool. Uh, kind of hard, so that's where we're trying to take lots of baby steps towards that, that vision of the future. Uh, next up, Rene is gonna be talking about personal fabrication in a, a little broader sense. Uh, he's done a whole bunch of uh, projects uh, around this, one of the things, for example, that we've, we've tried recently is um, to have um, a, uh, a wrist-worn device that uh, somebody could wear while they're doing an online presentation that would alert them to when people have a question. I mean, right here, if you have a question, you raise your hand, I see it, right? But remember Zoom lectures, right? Yeah, he's like, <laughs> you had a question, you post in the chat, and I would just go on and not notice you, right? Or you'd raise your tiny little yellow hand and I would still ignore you. Uh, there were lots of issues about this, right? And so we've tried to build some physical artifacts, like a wristband, uh, for example, to wear that would alert you um, to these things. But in general, personal fabrication is a whole subspace of HCI these days. And people have been looking at how can I write and build better tools so that people can take an idea they have in their head of an object and turn it into something that is actually a 3D printed thing. Right? How can they embed behavior into this thing? How they can, can they program embedded systems without having to have a degree in electrical engineering or computer science? So we're gonna talk about this in personal fabrication. And then um, soft robotics and jewelry is Anka's uh, uh, topic. And uh, in here, I don't know whether you've heard about soft robotics, but soft robotics is a, is a rapidly expanding space of, uh, sub, you know, sub area of 
robotics and, and human computer interaction, where you're not building robots from you know, your t typical industrial metal gears and, and arms and stuff, but you instead make them out of soft silicone and you use pneumatics like you know, pressed air, uh, compressed air for actuation. So these things, these soft robots, they actually move much more naturally, much more organically, more like people if you want, like, like you know, um, living beings than your typical you know, mechanical thing. And so they have a lot of interesting qualities. They won't hurt somebody as quickly as, a, as an industrial robot might. Uh, they often are less frightening. They might work better in certain social situations. Um, and Anka is exploring this whole space and will share uh, with you what you know, researchers around the world have been doing in this area. She's also been building some jewelry that is actually kinetic, so it moves. Um, so if you've ever wondered what you know, it might look like if somebody was wearing a necklace that some suddenly starts moving and what that would do to you, how you would react, uh, then this is going to be your topic. Um, yeah, I mean, you might remember this from DIS1 just as an aside, that remember the, the Gestalt laws and, and animation was such a strong cue for the eye, right? Oh, something moves, right? The eye latches onto that. So if you have anything that moves, like a you know, piece of jewelry, it really pulls attention. Right? And it, it evokes certain you know, ideas of, oh, that's cute, it's opening slowly, or oh, that's frightening, it shakes quickly. And so there's a lot of interesting things that you can evoke with, with kinetics. Um, next up, um, textiles in 3D printing. This is a bit related to the stuff over here. We've been looking at this. But here, uh, um, Adrian will talk about uh, an area where people are combining 3D printing and textiles to make um, interactive objects um, even uh, more easily. And yeah, Paul is smiling back there because he's been heavily involved in this. So if you want to get a sneak peek of that, you just need to talk to him after, after the class. Um, you know, suffice it to say that one of the things that, that uh, we have been developing here at the lab is a tool that where you can basically take a 3D model that you have in your computer and um, you upload it into the software that you know, Adrian and, and, and Paul wrote and you press essentially one button most of the time, right? Um, yeah, Paul is nodding. Uh, and then it basically gives you something that you can print onto a piece of fabric. It looks like this framework here and then you can you know, cut out the fabric around that and you can snap it together and you've got your 3D object much faster and, and then printing it all in full, you know, 3D plastic. And also you can, you know, decompose it again and unfold it again uh, and create things that use fabrics as coverage as opposed to uh, plastic, which gives you a lot of options because fabrics have been around for like, you know, centuries as a material. Well, and then finally, this is a little bit more uh, on, the, on, the, on the software side, um, Sebastian will take you through a tour of HCI research around augmented and virtual reality. So what are the things that are currently going on in this space? It's a very exciting space. Handheld augmented reality has become really big. People holding smartphones and you know, putting things into the real world. And that creates very unique situations sometimes, very unique opportunities for interaction. And some of these things we don't actually understand as HCI researchers yet. What happens if I, you know, how, how good am I at pointing at something that I can only see augmented on a smartphone that I'm holding in my hand? How good am I at actually pointing at that in, in the real world? We don't know. Right? So it gets into research that, that will help us better understand how human psychology and cognition and perception works when it is exposed to these new realities that haven't been around in the history of mankind before now. Okay, so that's all the various things that we're going to be doing um, in this second part. And you can see there's a certain sort of leaning towards this physicality of interfaces, but we also have research that uh, you know, is solidly in the software world. So don't be scared off. If, if you're afraid of hardware, uh, that's not a reason to, to run away from, from all that. Um, the mini HCI research project that you are going to be doing uh, will let you apply the methods that we teach in an actual project that you do. Um, so you will be coming out with a research question. Uh, you will analyze what kind of related work exists around this. You will actually design an experiment. So that means that you will you know, make a protocol, basically, uh, in kind of like a cookbook recipe on how your experiment will work. 
then you conduct that experiment, that study, usually with users, um, um, and you analyze the data, use your statistics. Uh, we're also going to talk about that a fair amount. And uh, you'll share your findings. So we will actually make you present your work at the very end in these presentations, uh, like at a conference, like at an academic conference, where you also usually get, you know, actually there you only get 10 minutes usually to talk about your work, and everything else needs to be in your paper that you wrote as a researcher. You guys aren't going to be writing a full paper on your research because we don't have the time for that in this semester. Uh, so the presentation slots are a little longer to give you a little bit extra time to share what you found and how you found it. That's going to be happening, as I said, in groups of three. And uh, our milestones and discussions will guide you along this process so that you don't get lost. Um, how do we evaluate this? Because I said, this is going to be part of your final grade. It's a small part, but it is a part. It's 30%. Um, so we're going to be looking at how well you applied the concepts that we teach you about you know, research contributions, uh, valid experiments, you know, making studies that, that actually mean something that are, don't have any confounding factors, blah, blah, blah. Um, how you did your statistics, whether they are sound. Uh, so we will follow basically those criteria that you will be learning about. So in the first couple of weeks, we're going to talk about this is how people do HCI research in general. Um, and there will be criteria for doing good research. And those are going to be the criteria that, surprise, surprise, we will be applying to your work. Right? Of course, not at the uh, standards level of, of you know, a world-class conference, but we expect you to do uh, proper work there where you can be confident that your findings are right and that they are proven in a certain way that is reliable and can be picked up by others with confidence. Um, all right, the grading scheme is the standard one that we always use, so it's nothing too exciting here. And here's the final grade distribution, and it's very simple, 30% for the project, because it does go on over a fair amount of weeks, um, but you're doing it in groups of three, and then the final exam will be most of your uh, grade. You also um, need to pass the exam, the final exam, to pass this course. So even if you got a 1.0 in your project, uh, you know, if you happen to uh, do a 5.0 in your exam, even if the average, I haven't worked it out, if it worked out above 4.0, you know, you wouldn't actually be uh, passing the class. So make sure you pass the final. Um, let's dive right in and talk about some of the sources that you'll get to know um, when looking for literature. Now, you've all taken at least uh, a pro seminar of some sorts uh, and probably a seminar too. Um, so you know how basic literature research works. Um, we're not going to repeat all that, but we want to explain to you particularly how, you know, how we look for work in HCI. Uh, now, there's two kinds of resources that I want to share with you. The first one is kind of about like the first part of this class too, right? Um, this is the fundamentals on how people do HCI research. Like what are the methods that are, that have evolved and that have proven themselves and that have been accepted in the community to be valid research methods. We're going to be talking about that in the first couple of weeks. And there is a wonderful book out there, um, now in its second edition for a couple of years, uh, called Research Methods in HCI um, by Jonathan Lazar. Um, and that's a highly recommended reading if you, especially if you're considering doing your thesis at our chair, um, because it actually gives you a lot of details about all these different evaluation methods that we have right now. So let's say you invented a new and um, you know a, a new way of doing input um, you know with textiles on the side of that armchair. So now you want to do a study. How, how do you get started with that? Like how many users do you need? What kind of things do you make those users do? How do you observe them? What do you record? What kind of questions do you ask them? How do you evaluate the results? When do you, how do you define success? What does it mean to have found something significant and not? So there's tons of questions and all of those um, you'll find answers to in this, in this first book. If you want to really dive deep into this, uh, then there's an, another one called Research Methods for the Behavioral Sciences, um, which is also, as you can see now, in the sixth edition, so quite a uh, long-standing and successful work that is uh, recommended if you want to find out more about all these experimental research methods. Um, 
the first one is, as you can see from the title, literally about research in HCI. So it's going to be very relevant uh, to what we do, and everything described in there uh, will matter for you as an HCI researcher. Um, the second one is uh, behavioral sciences in general, so it may not be as uh, fully targeted at human-computer interaction, right? It just looks at how people behave and how to observe them and how to study them, etc. Uh, we'll have a full list in Moodle of recommended readings and also some required readings that we need you to read. If something's required, that means uh, we can ask you about that in the exam, right? We just expect you to have grokked that content and, and processed it. Now, as we get to the, the second part of the class, um, we'll be pulling articles. And those articles are going to be from recent uh, conferences and journals. Right? Um, so let me talk real quick about those research, uh, uh, those, those sources of literature. Um, HCI is a bit of a peculiar topic in that, um, unlike many other areas, like I don't know, physics, for example, um, we tend to not publish all our, oh, how did that happen? Thank you. Um, uh, we did not publish all our, we do not publish all our work in journals, um, but I don't know, maybe because Kai researchers like to go to a conference every now and then, the most important work is actually getting published at conferences in, in HCI. Uh, you know, meaning you could imagine there's a bunch of people at CHI, for example, which is the biggest uh, international research conference in the field of HCI. It's called CHI, written C-H-I. Um, you have, I don't know, maybe 3,000 people coming together. Um, and what do they do? Well, they present the papers that they've submitted to this conference before. And only a very small amount of those papers that got submitted actually make it in usually less than a quarter of the papers that, that were sent in. And so those papers that got accepted get a chance to give a, you know, the authors get a chance to give a brief talk at the conference to share with everybody else what they've been doing. But that talk is really just a teaser to get, you know, involved with the actual paper. Because as I said before, papers are the way that we, you know, that we share knowledge in the HCI, uh, in the research community, in HCI as well as in others. And so um, CHI is the biggest conference annually that, that is about this topic, the, the most prestigious one, the one with the highest impact. So if you manage to publish something at CHI, a lot of people will actually read it and notice it. So that's good. We tend to try to send all our work to conferences like this, like CHI, um, because we want to make sure that you know it's hard to get in there. But if we do get in there, then it actually pays off by getting you know, recognized on, sort of on a worldwide level. Um, there are other conferences that also have a similar high standard, but they are more topically focused, right? So they're not about all of human-computer interaction, but maybe about more like subspaces of that. And some of these are very relevant to the work that we do, um, and that's why I'm mentioning them here. WIST is one of them. Uh, WIST stands for User Interface Software and Technology. And you can tell from the name, uh, it's a bit more of a technical conference, right? So that's where you're going to see more people papers that have a heavy computer science-y algorithmic part to the research that was done, um, and less, for example, about the design aspects of, of, an, of a system or design research, uh, design findings. Um, DIS is the exact opposite. So that stands for Designing Interactive Systems, just like our class. Um, and that conference um, actually looks at um, findings that are mostly about how did people react to this system what did we learn about the interface design that we did here? And what kind of you know, research findings can we draw from? So a less technical conference, I would say. Um, ISS is another conference that we tend to uh, frequent quite a bit. That stands for Interactive Spaces and Surfaces. And that's because for a long time, uh, we've been doing a lot of work with touch-based interfaces, whether it's textile touch or touch on tables or touch on mobile devices. That's always been somehow you know, that, that manual interaction has always uh, kept my, my interest, and I've always find, found it exciting and, and sort of undervalued. It's kind of sad that we're poking around on glass surfaces with one finger these days. Your hands are so much more capable of, of doing amazing things, you know, than that. So 
Um, I'd like to push that forward, and so that's why we often end up also at this, at this conference. And then finally, there is Ubicom, and that will probably, this is where you can you know, let your DIS knowledge shine. If you've taken DIS, that name means something. Yeah, can you tell us what that, that is? is really um, lovely. That was a, a, I think a company that like, tried to put uh, tech into everything that is around. So for example, in, in books, like with the microcontrollers and something like that, mm -hmm. and uh, they wanted that everything is connected with, with each other. And yes. they also built like little devices, so like uh, uh, little mm -hmm. version of the smartphone. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. and uh, for example, iPads, but uh, they were not like user bound. They were like sort of in, in the room and everybody. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, 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 very good. Yeah, so that was the vision of Ubicomp uh, by the research team at Xerox Park, right? The research division of, of the company Xerox. Um, and uh, while that was a vision, and it was back in the 90s, so stuff wasn't really technically, you know, very advanced and, and very much working, um, the idea of ubiquitous computing, of Ubicomp for short, has stuck around and has stuck with people because it's so compelling to put technology into everyday life, but making it disappear, right? Not in your face, not like, you know, all, grabbing all your attention. So that's why Ubicom continues to exist also as a conference and is also one that we often uh, uh, take research findings from. So that's all the conferences happen. That's not all of them, there's many more. And as we go through this, uh, you will learn how to, you know, find the conferences that are gonna be relevant for your work. Where do you locate the re related work that is of good quality, that you can read with confidence without having to worry whether it's actual proper research or not. Um, and that is in your field, I will teach you that. And then there's journals, um, as I said, not a big, as big a role in HCI as in other fields, but it's actually growing a bit. And, and one of the most prominent ones is called uh, ACM Transactions on Computer-Human Interaction, so, or TOCHI for short, T-O-C-H-I. Um, and that also comes out a couple of times a year and has longer articles about work. Uh, these papers, um, you know, there's one that we, that we did that has a paper from us actually in there. Um, and uh, it's, it's work that takes usually a little longer to get published. It's more, it gets more editorial reviews and, and correction rounds. Um, and you can say, very, very roughly speaking, most of the papers that you publish at a conference, since the next year's conference is coming around you know, after a year, most of these papers report on like the latest findings, right? very up to date, uh, but also often not that, not relevant for that long a time. So after a couple years, they might be dated because new findings were, were being discovered that then again get published at this conference. So there you can really see the work building on each other each week, each year. Whereas things that appear in journals sometimes tend to be a little longer lived. So they are maybe have a relevance of, of, of more of a longer time. You can't say that, you know, in general, because it will depend on how good the article is and how important the work turns out to be for everybody else, but that's a, that's a very rough guideline. Um, all right, so those, those are the sources. Now, um, when you do your own work, for example, let's say you're, you're uh, working on uh, one of those textile interfaces and you want to start your own you know, write up or your presentation by saying, um, you know, that textile interfaces are, you know, have a, have a problem when you use them without looking at them, right? You need to use them eyes free and that's a challenge. You could just say that and maybe people will believe it, but maybe they won't, maybe they will challenge your, your opinion. Um, if you want to make, turn it into an uh, academic statement, then you need to back it up with a citation from somewhere where you read that, right? So hopefully you found a paper that already documented this, this claim and that paper got published, which means that before it got published, it got reviewed. So it's sort of an accepted piece of the knowledge of the community. Um, now, if you just read this other paper and then you quote them verbally, you know, uh, verbatim, without actually um, telling anybody that you're taking that text from that other paper, that's plagiarism. That's not good, right? So we don't do that. So here's an example. Um, let's say somewhere you found something about usability testing, right? Uh, so this is a statement um, taken from a, from a paper. I've got the quote later down on, the, on this page. Um, 
and let's say you read this in a paper, and you write your own uh, paper, and you send that to a conference, let's say, uh, and you say this, right? Usability testing, blah, blah, blah. Um, so basically, you're quoting this other paper word for word, right? If you do that, you put quotes around it, and you really quote literally. You don't change the text, right? That's proper verbatim citation uh, and quoting. Uh, and after that comes the most important part, the uh, square brackets around like the source. Like where is this from? Who said that? Because if anybody challenges this statement of yours, they need to be able to verify how it came about. Like who said this? How did they prove it? So they can follow that back to its source and find out what these people did to arrive at that statement, right? Um, the other thing that you can do, and that's also perfectly legitimate to do that, as long as you have this, uh, this reference here, is to take the meaning of this and say this in your own words, right? For example, I took from this that usability testing has the large impact on strategic improvement, right? So that's, it's, it's paraphrasing what was being said there, maybe shortening it a bit. That's also okay, but you need to have the citation back there, right? Um, and here's a typical citation, right? It's got the names of the authors, it's got the title of the paper, it's got the conference where this appeared. This was actually a CHI conference in 2000, and it's got the publisher ACM. It's a fairly short way of saying this, because everybody in our community knows ACM because it's the association that publishes um, the CHI proceedings and most of the other conference proceedings that are important to us. If you have something exotic, you might need a couple more details here. Also, these days, you would probably usually have the DOI, uh, the document object identifier, uh, behind that because that is wonderful. Um, people can click on that and the link directly takes them to the paper um, online. Right? So, uh, but this is basically one of the ways that you would see this citation. So do this um, and don't leave these out, right? So cite and quote instead of plagiarizing, right? Uh, make sure that you um, don't do this. Um, this, is, uh, this is important, I think, to understand um, because this is how research works, right? If we don't do this, then, then the, the whole research process as, as a global effort kind of collapses in on itself, right? If you say something what, that you read somewhere else, first of all, you're kind of stealing that author's you know, intellectual uh, original discovery, which is not good. Um, but you might say, well, I'm not being nice, but who cares, right? But the other thing is also then when you say that, and I don't know where you found that and where that claim is coming from, I have no way of verifying it, right? I have no way of, of knowing if I can trust what you said. So it's making it less valuable as a statement. So you'll often find that you know, the beginnings of a paper will often have you know, lots of references to other papers because the author is making a case for their point their, of origin, where they started their research. They said, this is a problem, this is the situation, these other things have been tried, and this is this partial success we've seen. But here's the thing that hasn't been tried yet. That's what I am doing. So when I get that kind of introduction, when I read a paper, and I get that kind of, you know, I get introduced into the topic that way, then I understand, oh, that person has actually read the literature. What they are doing is very likely actually new and not something that somebody else has done already. Um, so you're really just trying to build a good case for your own work. Right? So it's really important. Um, that's also why uh, websites are not a great place for for uh, citations. Why? Because the website can change tomorrow, right? One of the uh, foundations of academic work is that I can trust that a paper that I cite today will still be there for others to look at in the exact same way tomorrow. It's about, you know, a safe data storage, you could say, from a technical point of view. I know if something is in the ACM digital library, if it was published at a conference, I know there's a version of that paper that says something that I can refer to in 10 years from now, and somebody else can look at that paper and they will find the exact same document. It's not like the author could go in later and suddenly change some of this paper without anybody noticing, right? That's not possible. This is possible with websites. That's why websites are not a good source of academic reference. You know, they might still have interesting things, and people do point to websites to make a case, but then they say, well, I read this on here, and I accessed it on this date, and that's when this website said this and this, right? Um, but it's usually not enough to back up a, an academic claim. 
So um, don't plagiarize. If you do, uh, it's going to be a 5.0 immediately. So uh, you're cutting your semester short that way. Uh, we may report this onto the uh, department and the university uh, because we're really trying to uh, get a very solid grip on, on any case of plagiarism because it really reflects back badly, not just on you, but on the department and the whole university. Um, and it's taking a pretty strict uh, approach that that's getting uh, stricter and stricter these days. Um, if it happens in repeated cases or very heavy cases, like in your thesis, for example, um, that might ban you not just from our classes, but you can also have, uh, you can get matriculated or there is a fine to be paid. So really not a good idea. Uh, and it's not necessary, right? Because you just need to be honest about where you found something, right? Uh, and then that's perfectly fine. In fact, that's expected that you build on other people's work and your own work. But it helps to also understand when somebody reads your paper, what is your contribution, whereas what is other people's contribution. Right? That is super important. OK, so uh, that was a little sort of you know, um, prelude to where I wanted to take you. Um, it's, it's tricky to start to wrap your head around like what HCI research is. I've thought about a couple different ways of introducing that. Um, if you've taken DIS-1, then you know what human-computer interaction is in general. You know what usability means. You know what a user interface is, what a good user interface is, what a bad user interface is. Um, you've understood how users think and, and how they interact with technology. Uh, but what is HCI research? And so one thing that I, I think this is probably one of the most helpful papers I've ever read as a researcher in HCI. Um, is a paper from Jacob Wobrock and uh, his colleague Julie Keynes uh, that was published in 2016. It was actually published in Interactions. Um, Interactions is a, a magazine, so it's not an academic journal. It has a little bit of a lighter touch to it. It's more also geared towards the practitioners. But this particular article is actually squarely addressing uh, a research question, which is, it basically tells us um, what kind of things do people contribute when they, when they do HCI research. And you might say, well, what, what does it mean to contribute? I'm doing research, and then I write it down, and that's my contribution, right? Well, but there's still different ways of doing that. Um, and we will see the seven research contribution types that uh, uh, Wobrock and his colleagues identified and this has been a very successful paper. It has been so successful that it actually was used in conferences like CHI to structure the reviewing and, and, and uh, process, et cetera, to understand the different contribution types, to, to sort papers into bins, basically. Um, so it's really quite, quite helpful. I should say that Jacob Woodbrook is also an excellent researcher himself anyway. Um, he's gotten, you know, I don't know, two dozen awards for the, his papers at this point. So it's been really prolific and really successful. He's studied um, interfaces for universal usability, which was sort of a new way of looking at interfaces for the disabled. Um, he's done some really awesome work there. Um, at some point, one of his really early projects, for example, was uh, a slide rule project. And that later turned into what you can now find as voiceover on Apple's uh, devices, where you can you can know, like browse an interface by listening to it rather than having to be able to visually uh, see it. Um, so he's really been uh, uh, quite instrumental in his research and impactful, for example, for usability for, for blind people and visually impaired. Uh, so he also received the Social Impact Award a couple of years ago. And if you want to uh, see a really good video, then uh, look up his, um, his acceptance speech or his short talk that he gave as part of that Social Impact Award. It's really very, very interesting. Um, but back to this paper. So um, what are these contribution types? Here's a graph also taken from the same uh, paper um, that looked at the CHI 2016 conference and the proceedings of the conference and all the papers that had made it into, into the conference and also actually all the ones that didn't make it into the conference that did, did get rejected. And for each paper, I tried to figure out what kind of contribution has been made in that paper. And I just wanted to show you this graph. Uh, what you can see here is um, CHI 2016 received 
over 2,000 submissions, so over 2,000 papers were being sent to Kai. Um, a bit over 500 got accepted, so we got an acceptance rate of around a quarter, roughly, uh, like I said before. And here are the uh, papers, uh, the gray ones are the submissions, the um, blue one in percent, right, as percent of submissions, and percent of program uh, in the blue uh, column here. So you can see that, let's first take a look at the submitted papers. Um, you can see most of the papers that were submitted belonged to a contribution type that's called empirical study of system use. And that's kind of what you might expect. Uh, it's, I have a system, let's take that you know, armchair with its textile buttons on it, and I sit down a couple people in it, I let them try it, and I observe how well they do, and I test how well they can distinguish different types of buttons, maybe on that, on that armchair. Um, and uh, I send in my results, I, I send in my findings. Right? I say, well, I discovered that you know, the following shapes are easy to recognize by touch, and these ones are not so easy to recognize by touch, and these are the results from my, my, from my study. So that's a typical Chi paper, that's why 44% of submissions and also 44% of the accepted papers actually uh, contain that kind of contribution. There's another one that is closely related, and I should say that uh, papers can actually be in more than one uh, uh, contribution type. That's why this adds up to more than 100%. Right? So, um, for example, you might build an artifact, so some kind of system, and then you might test, uh, you know, evaluate it in your paper, and so we've got both kinds of contributions. So the second one is empirical study of people. That is a little more geared toward actually looking at human behavior and less at a particular interaction with a particular technology. But it's very similar to the first one. The third one is artifact or system. That's the one I said for you. You build something. You build a device. And usually, just building a device, in most cases, that's not enough. Right? You need to somehow prove that your device is what better in some way than what's out there. It makes input faster, or people prefer it more, or it leads to fewer errors that people make, or it's, I don't know, smaller, or can be used in different situations, whatever. Um, so there's usually, when you have an artifact in your system, there's usually going to be some kind of validation, some kind of empirical study um, also going to be in your paper. Uh, then come sort of more exotic areas. Um, Submitting things about um, HCI research methods or theories or arguments, uh, essays, which are sort of more like opinion papers, or literature surveys where you, the content of your research paper is actually reviewing lots and lots and lots of other papers and structuring the, the whole uh, body of research into, into what, you know, what are current trends in, in published uh, uh, literature, or submitting a data set like, you know, um, 500,000 uh, force over time profiles from key clicks on a keyboard that you can then use for, for other um, purposes. We're going to go through each of these uh, in more detail. Um, so, but you can see that the majority of papers that actually also make it into CHI and that also get submitted, there aren't that huge difference between the submission you know, and, and accepted rate here. So. Um, there aren't any kinds of submissions that are much, much less likely or much, much more likely to be accepted. But just from the sheer number, you can see that almost all the papers are going to have some kind of study in there. And uh, artifacts are quite prominent in chi as well as methods, too. And then it rapidly drops off. OK, so um, I should also say that just because literature surveys are less frequent at CHI does not mean that they are less valuable. Right? Uh, they are very valuable. They take, some of these things just take an enormous amount of work to do, and very few people get around to doing all that work at that high standard to then be able to write a CHI paper about it. Similarly, uh, for a theory, you, know, you need much more evidence to prove an entire theory, like you know, Pitt's Law or something like that. You need much more work to actually make that a case and get it published. So there's just few, less work of that, um, of that impact going around. Let's take a look at empirical contributions first. So empirical contributions are based on two things. You can do two things if somebody is interacting with a technology. 
I can either watch you use the technology and gather some data that way, like measure things, or I can talk to you, right? Um, so uh, empirical is usually based on observation and data gathering. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be um, quantitative. It doesn't mean that I need to have numbers, like, like execution time, or how fast were you typing the text with that keyboard that I gave you. It doesn't have to be that. It could also be qualitative, um, for example, to understand, uh, I noticed you didn't use, you know, that one of the three devices I gave you. Why didn't you use it? Right? That would be a qualitative question. I'm not getting any numbers out of it, but I'm getting insight into why you acted the way that you did. So, um, empirical contributions can come from experiments. You know, I give you a standard keyboard and I give you a new keyword that we designed, um, and I'll let you guys type some text, right? And I do that with lots of people, not just two people, otherwise it would be you know, kind of pointless. So to get statistical significance and robust results, I would do that with lots of people and I would do typical experiments. Um, I can also go out in the field, right? I can go out and, um, for example, watch people. Uh, remember DIS1, where you had to go out and watch people use things like, you know, ticket automata, for example. Uh, that's a typical field observation where you can learn something about how people use technology in real life. Um, observing means I don't talk to people, right? Interview means I do talk to people, right? It's a very, very different beast, but both things are super important. Um, because as you may know from DIS1, people may tell you one thing uh, about how they use the system, but they may actually do something else. So for example, how many hours are you using, you know, social media each week? You're gonna give me an estimate and it's probably gonna be off, and not because you wanna cheat me or lie, right? It's just because you don't have a good sense of these things. Um, so it's often important to also measure. And then sometimes that miss, you know, this mismatch between what people say and what they do is actually a in really interesting find because something is going on there. But you can also go and send out a survey. Right? Send out, we, we sometimes do that too. Send out a survey to lots of people, which means you're not gonna be interacting with these people, you know, face to face. Uh, which means the quality of the data you're going to get back is a little less great because you know people are going to be interpreting your questions the way they be and understand them. You have no way of clarifying them, you know, you know face to face. But you may reach many more people. So if the questions are very clear and very easy to answer in the right uh, way, so that people don't make any misinterpretations about it, uh, then it's a wonderful tool. Uh, focus groups, diaries. Diaries means. Um, uh, actually having people write down what they do. Um, for example, we've had people uh, walk around their house for a day and, and tell us all the things that they touched, you know, um, just to find out uh, what kind of touch, ob and what kind of objects might be touch enabled for, for additional interaction. Um, ethnography is the study of uh, observing people that, that is its own kind of thing uh, from the social sciences. Um, and uh, that HCI has kind of adopted, right? You can go out and watch a community of people using a, uh, a technology for a while, uh, in the wild, so to say, and draw your, uh, try, try to not mess with the set setting at all and try to observe original behavior. We can also use technology, right? We can have sensors installed and find out how often do people, you know, open the cupboards in their kitchen in, in a day to figure out whether it makes sense to, I don't know, maybe automate part of that process. And of course, log files are also a great way to technically collect data. Um, each of the contribution types that we have, and we're starting with empirical right now, right? Each of the contribution types will have a particular way of you, the author, showing the reader that what you did is true. Because I could say, um, I observed some users um, and users really hate, you know, hate touch input. You know, they really love, they find voice input so much more valuable. But if that's all I told you, you'd be like, eh, <laughs> how do you know, right? What did you do to find out? Did you just talk to three of your friends? 
or did you, you know, get a thousand people in and ran a five month experiment on this? I want to understand how trustful that is. And, and here's the one sentence that I keep finding myself saying most often when I have to review papers, you know, Kai or whatever. The key question about a paper is, can I pick up the results with confidence? If the reader of a paper can pick up the results of that paper with confidence, then it's a good paper. I mean, the results may be earth shattering or they may be not so earth shattering. They may be big or small, maybe a big contribution, a small contribution, but it's key whether I can take that contribution, whatever it is, and actually trust that it's true and that I can take it with confidence and build on it in my own research or in my own, you know, practical endeavors. Maybe I'm a designer and I'm getting some guidelines on how to design these textile interfaces and furniture and I'm building a business on top of that. I want to be able to actually trust the findings in that paper and not find that they are wrong right, after, um, after applying them. So being able to pick up results from a paper with confidence, how do we do that? authors? Well, we validate what we say. We validate our findings uh, and that's what we mean with the soundness of the method. Like, did we actually evaluate this in a way that is okay, you know, that, that the reader can trust? So both. The importance, you know, the, that new con contribution is important, but also whether I can actually pick that up with confidence. Um, and I should maybe say that uh, you can have one and the same result, and what you then make out of that result, what you claim based, of, based on your result, it can actually lead to your results being completely unfounded or, or very well founded. Let's say I ran a study with all you guys here in the room, right? And I tested, I don't know, a new input device. Uh, let, let's take that, you know, that textile armchair. I tested it with all you guys. And I say, Based on that result, you know, people in general, you know, this is great for all ages, right? Eh, I don't know. I don't see many 60 euros in the room, not even myself, right? So um, that's a bit of overclaiming on what you did, right? You would have to say, well, I tested those with 20 users and they were all in the ages between whatever, you know, 22 and 28 or something. Um, hope I'm not stepping on anybody's toes. But uh, so that, that's important, right? And if I know that, then the reader can say, okay, I know for this age group, this is what they got, right? Not sure whether it transfers to other age groups. Maybe that's a new study to do, right? That could be a, a follow-up work that could be done. Uh, but if I don't have that information, if we leave that out, then it's hard for me to know whether I can trust the findings. So here's an example. Uh, this is the paper from CHI 2009, um, where somebody studied the uh, the efficacy of soft buttons on touchscreens compared to hard buttons. Remember, 2009 means this was the iPhone had just been out for like a year or two. Right? So touchscreens were not, or were just getting into everybody's hands. And, and the Kai community was excited, like, whoa, there's this new stuff out there. Let's see, because before people had been pressing hard buttons, right, you know, actual physical buttons, and now everybody was using these touchscreens um, uh, really a lot. And so they were running a study and wanted to figure out, are these touch screens any good. Uh, so they studied uh, a traditional hard button calculator, for example, here, and then here a soft button calculator, whether, you know, the way that it would look on an iPhone today, where the buttons are on here and you push them with the finger. And they even, because back then this was still a thing, uh, used a stylus to see whether that changed interaction in any way. Um, they actually didn't do just one empirical experiment, but three. Um, the first one checked this operation mode, right? So they said finger or stylus on the soft screen. That was, uh, were two conditions that they just uh, distinguished. They also tried out different feedback modes, meaning they made their experiment more complicated, which means you need more users to run it reliably to get good data, but it makes it more interesting what you find because they said, well, a touch screen where I just touch and nothing happens except you know, maybe the visual button you know, changes. That's one thing, but what if the soft button actually clicked, you know, audibly, or maybe even gave me a little tap back with, with you know, a, a vibration motor or a haptic engine, as I like to call it now. Um, does that help, 
does it make any difference? These were the kinds of things that people were really wondering about back in those times. So that's why that was an important study to do. Uh, they also tested uh, the n then new uh, capacitive touch against the then standard resistive touch. Nowadays, resistive touch screens are broadly defined as the touch screens that suck when you try to use them because you have to like, you know, poke them really hard and they can't really do multi-touch well and if you need to press and drag, it's kind of, you know, rubs off the end of your finger. So resistive touch screens are not, I mean, they're still being used in some situations, like when things get wet, you know, passive touch screen just goes bonkers, right? So sometimes you need resistive touch screens. Um, but back then, this was the, you know, the, the, the new thing and people wanted to figure out what, what influence does the activation mechanism um, they also were wondering, what about the button size? Like, you know, what if I make the touch screens bigger or smaller? Is there, is there going to be a difference in how well people can use them? Um, and again, the activation mechanism was combined with that. And what did they measure? Well, they did input accuracy, so how many, you know, wrong passes people did. Uh, they tried speed, so how fast could they operate this thing uh, to type in, let's say, uh, you know, a 10-digit number on this calculator thing how many corrections were happening, uh, and that's all, you can observe all that, right? You don't need to speak to your users about this. And then they also added this other lens where they said, I also want to talk to these people and figure out uh, how did you like them? Because how fast people or how effective people are with their interface and how much they like it usually correlates, as you would expect, right? But not always. There are sometimes cases where people actually tend to prefer one way, even though the other one is actually more effective. There's a bunch of reasons for that. I'm not going to get into this but now, but um, that's why it's always interesting to do both of these things. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the details here. Uh, they, they found actually that you know, soft buttons were doing pretty well in general for like you know, dialing phone numbers or like using a calculator, uh, sometimes even faster than hard buttons. Um, you know, they found stylus could actually be a little bit more accurate than finger, obviously, because the tip is finer. You can see more of the screen and you can point at smaller, uh, uh, smaller targets. Um, and they also found, one thing that I thought was interesting, they found that audio feedback helps. Right? If the button clicks, that helps. You've probably experienced the same thing. Um, if it taps back to you, like a, some kind of force feedback, that also helps. But combining the two didn't actually give you any additional benefits. So one was good enough. Um, all right, uh, here's another example. More recent paper, this was actually from our own lab. Uh, Christian Scherich, who did his PhD here a while ago, uh, ran a study um, with, what he wanted to understand is if we have a multi-touch tabletop, like this big one here, uh, this is a like, two meter uh, multi-touch table, it's the one that's out in the hall here, you can see it when you walk, up, uh, walk down the hallway, um, then, he wanted to figure out if I put objects on this table, like tangible, physical objects, and let people interact with that in a group, is that going to help folks in the group to better understand what everybody is doing? Then the other situation is everybody just using the touch screen, right? using their fingers directly on the virtual content on the screen. Are the tangibles helping with mutual awareness of, you know, what are you doing in your area of the table while I'm doing my thing over here? So we ran that study uh, with groups of you know, two users up to four users who were playing a game. Uh, you can see it was playing like a whack-a-mole game that we implemented for the purpose uh, that grabbed their attention. And then every now and then, somebody in their area would actually do something that would make your game a little harder, right? And you had to notice that. Uh, and the way that you noticed this was by what, noticing this other person doing a particular move. And we had them do that move by just touching or by using a physical tangible, uh, and we measured how long it took people to realize that somebody else was doing that particular move. Um, you know, again, uh, I'm not gonna be talking about the results here so much. We brief basically found that yes, tangibles do help raise, uh, increase mutual awareness. But it's another example of a typical empirical experiment, uh, experimental study. So, as you can see, seven contribution types. We've only talked about one right now. But trust me, the others are not going to take as long because they are less uh, frequent at CHI and there's less to, to uh, say about them, a little less at least. Um, 
So what do you need to do now as we wrap up? This is the last slide. Um, we need you to register for the class on RWH online. Uh, we also need you to upload your signed declaration of compliance following that naming scheme I mentioned earlier. Um, do that today. So you can find both the declaration of compliance and the link to the SIBO the drive where you need to upload it once you've signed it um, on our class jump page. Right? So very easy to, to get there. It's already there. Um, also, I want to encourage you to check out our other classes. Uh, so this semester, uh, we're not just teaching current topics in HCI, this research class. We're also teaching Designing Interactive Systems 2. Uh, which is a class about the technical aspect of building user interfaces. Um, and that's going to be a class with lots of coding, because there we actually focus a lot also on the software side, on how do user interfaces work. So if you were always curious about, like, how on earth would I write my own tiny little window system where I could move, you know, things around on the screen and have mouse events being tracked or multi-touch events being dis detected, this is the class for you. That's coding heavy, very different from DIS1, which was light on coding. Um, uh, and it basically takes you through, you know, we're talking about I don't know, the various window toolkits for Java, for Mac OS, for iOS, for Windows. Um, we go into things like um, um, embedded systems. We talk about like how you prototype embedded functionality with stuff like the Arduino. Um, software fabrication is also one of the topics in there. Audio and haptics are a topic in there. So it's more about the technology of, if, if you want to say, if DIS1 was the class uh, that was kind of like the, the DIS conference, then DIS2 is kind of like the WIST conference, like it's the technical part of HCI that, that we're going to get you exposed to. So that starts tomorrow. Um, first class is uh, tomorrow on Wednesday. So feel free to check that out as well. Um, and uh, other than that, I mean, seminars and prac uh, practical labs, I don't need to talk about because those are all basically set at this point. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.